thank you for the introduction. Today I've been asked to talk to you about the management of patients with heart failure who have both reduced and preserved ejection fractions, and that essentially covers everything in heart failure. Now I could speak about this all day, but because we have just 15 minutes, and I know I'm the last one between you and your next snack break, uh, we'll try and condense it as much as possible and just hit the highlights for this presentation. So these are my disclosures. In terms of our objectives, we'll first provide a brief definition of the different types of heart failure because you've already heard a little bit about this already. And then we'll move into the meat of the talk, which focuses on an overview of the medical therapies used in heart failure with reduced and preserved ejection fraction. So basically, heart failure can be divided into three main categories based on the left ventricular ejection fraction. I'm so glad that Dr. Nesbitt already told you what that is on echo. Uh, that's LVEF for short. So if patients have heart failure with reduced ejection fraction or HEFREF, we're really talking about those folks with an LVEF of 40% or less. Essentially, these people have weak hearts and have trouble pumping oxygenated blood forward to the rest of their bodies. On the other hand, HEFPEF, or heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, are those people with an LVEF of 50% or more. These patients have preserved pump function, but their hearts are stiff and can't relax properly, so this leads to difficulty in their left ventricles filling properly, which then results in fluid buildup and congestion in their lungs, as well as other parts of their body. And then we have HEFMEF, which is heart failure with mid-range ejection fraction that covers everything in between. But for the purpose of this talk, we'll just go through HEFREF and HEFPEF. So let's start off first with HEFREF. Our first case is about a 30-year-old gentleman with a new diagnosis of polycythemia rubavira, and it's fairly fresh in his mind, so, so fresh, in fact, that he's not taking any of his medications that he's supposed to for this. And he comes to medical attention to us on May 13th because he sustained a VF arrest at home. He was transferred to Sunnybrook as a code STEMI, and the core angiogram essentially shows a left main equivalent. He has 100% blockages in his left anterior descending and left circumflex arteries, and the interventionalists have a really difficult time opening up those arteries because their catheters keep on clotting off over and over again because of his untreated polycythemia. But eventually, they manage to throw down two drug-eluting stents into his left anterior descending and left circumflex arteries. But by this point, he's got ongoing cardiogenic shock, and they have to insert a centromag, which is a form of mechanical circulatory support. Thankfully, he stabilizes and recovers his LV ejection fraction from 15% to 37%. And as a matter of fact, after a week, we're able to take that centromag out, and he's discharged home from hospital one month later. Okay, let's just say he comes and sees you a few months later in clinic, and at that time he tells you he can only walk about two minutes at cardiac rehab. His medications include bisoprolol 10, perinopril 2, spironolactone 50, bumetanide 2 twice daily, as well as his aspirin and ticagrelor for his fairly fresh stents. On examination, his blood pressure is 98 over 72, pulse is regular at 78 beats per minute. He has some decreased air entry in the right lower lobe and his JVP is elevated, but there is no peripheral edema, and when you look at his blood work, it looks fairly normal. So I want you to keep these details in mind, especially his medications, because my next question to you guys, yes, we're going to ask you questions before you get a chance to ask us <laughs> some, I'm going to ask you, how do you want to manage this patient, okay? And basically, you've got five choices. So who wants to increase the perinopril? A, hands up. Okay, just a smattering, like three hands. Okay, how about B? Add Secubitril Valsartan. Okay, another couple of hands up. How about C, add Avabradine? No one, okay. What about D, replace Perinopril with Secubitril Valsartan? Oh, more hands up for this one. And then, I don't think I got everyone in the room, so I'm assuming that the rest of you guys are gonna choose E, which is not sure, right? <laughs> okay, all right, so fair enough. Well, let's, let's look what the answer is. So this is a fairly busy slide, but essentially it illustrates the complex compensatory mechanisms that are activated when people are in heart failure. And essentially that means turning on the sympathetic nervous system and hormones that retain sodium and water. So the mainstay 
therapy for patients with HEFREF involves using three classes of medications that counteract these negative compensatory mechanisms. And this includes beta blockers, ACE inhibitors or ARBs, and aldosterone antagonists, or MRAs for short. Okay? We all know multiple trials have shown beta blockers reduce mortality and heart failure hospitalizations in patients with HEFREF, but they also help to make the heart a little bit stronger. So this figure illustrates LVEF on the y-axis, and you've got time of months on the x-axis. And as you can see, the people on metoprolol actually demonstrated an improvement in their LV ejection fraction at the three-month mark. Additionally, ACE inhibitors have also been shown to improve survival in patients with both ischemic and non-ischemic cardiomyopathy. And finally, aldosterone antagonists have been demonstrated with similar benefits, i.e. they improve survival and reduce heart failure or hospitalizations. So our job, whenever we see anyone come in with HEFREF, is to make sure that they are on these three classes of medications, beta blockers, ACE inhibitors, MRAs, and we want to start low and go slow. And that's because obviously these medications have side effects, which were kind of alluded to in some of the other talks, like symptomatic hypotension, bradycardia, or hyperkalemia, to name a few. Yeah? So our goal is to ultimately start low, but you want to be up titrating these medications at least every two to four weeks so that ultimately you reach the doses that were used in the clinical trials or as high as you get your patients without giving them intolerable side effects. And that's what we call optimal medical therapy. And it's very important to reach optimal medical therapy because we know that the benefits of these drugs are dose dependent. So this figure illustrates that point. In the US Carvalhol Trials Program, Patients were randomized to receive either placebo or varying doses of carvedilol. And as you can see, at the six-month mark, only the patients on the highest doses of carvedilol received the maximal benefits in terms of increase in their LV ejection fractions. So the 2017 Canadian Cardiovascular Society Heart Failure Guidelines state that for anyone with HEFREF, they need to be on what's called triple therapy. And that means we're going to hammer this home. <laughs> beta blockers, ACE inhibitors, and MRAs, right? Unless there are contraindications. Then you start low, go slow. You up titrate at least every two to four weeks until you reach target doses or the maximum tolerated evidence-based dose. And these are those doses that you're aiming towards. So for perindopril, the maximum tolerated dose or the clinical trial dose is actually four to eight millimeter um, milligrams daily. So that's exactly what we did for our patient since he was only on two milligrams once daily at the time of his clinic visit. Okay, so let's fast track. Many months later, he comes back to your office. Now you've got him up to bisoprolol 10, perinopril 8, spironolactone 50 in addition to everything else. But despite that, his echocardiogram shows that his LVF has deteriorated to 25%. And in the interim, a defibrillator has been implanted. He currently has MYHA class three symptoms and that he can only walk one block and climb up one flight of stairs now before getting short of breath. When you examine him, his blood pressure is 102 over 76. Pulse is regular at 89 beats per minute. He still has that decreased air entry in the right lower lobe and his JVP is still elevated, but he only has trace pitting edema around his left ankle. And once more, his lab work is quite normal. So I'm gonna ask you this question again. It's the same set of answers. So now what do you do? Any votes for increasing perinopril? No, okay. How about adding secubitril valsartan? No hands up there either. What about adding in evabradine? Okay, we got some takers for evabradine. What about replacing perinopril with secubitril valsartan? Okay, a lot of you guys are good test takers. You know it's gonna be either B or D that's right, right? Okay, the way I've phrased it. And E, not sure. Okay, good. So this brings us to the bottom half of this diagram here, which tells you what to do if your patients continue to have MYJ class two to four symptoms on optimal medical therapy. And essentially at this point, this is where you can start contemplating switching out your ACE inhibitor to an ARNI or adding an Avabradine depending on your heart rate. So let's talk about these two newer heart failure um, medical therapies in a little bit more detail, starting with the ARNI, otherwise known as Secubitril Valsartan or Entresto. So Secubitril Valsartan simultaneously promotes the natriuretic peptide pathway and inhibits 
the RAS system, using its two components, Secubitril, which is the neprilysin inhibitor, uh, shown on this side of the screen here, as well as Valsartan, which everyone knows is an angiotensin receptor blocker. So I'm not going to tell you more about this pathway because I think Dr. Cherney already did a good job on that. <laughs> In the Paradigm HF trial, over 8,400 patients with HEFREF and MYHA class 2 to 4 symptoms were randomized to receive either Secubitril Valsartan or Enalapril in addition to recommended therapy. And it was demonstrated that Secubitril Valsartan actually resulted in a significantly lower primary endpoint, i.e. death from causes, uh, cardiovascular causes, or heart failure hospitalizations when compared to the people who are on enalapril. And additionally, it also resulted in a significantly lower all-cause mortality compared to the patients on enalapril. So let's switch gears a little bit and talk more about Evabradine or Lancora. Now, Evabradine blocks the funny channel, that's its actual name, in the sinus node. And what it does is it essentially slows down the depolarization slope and stretches out your RR interval so that your heart rate will be slowed down that way without affecting contractility or systole. And the reason why this is important is because we know that resting heart rate is directly related to mortality in patients with heart failure. Essentially, lower heart rate equals lower mortality. So that's why most heart failure clinicians target a resting heart rate of about 50 to 60 beats per minute, or as low as tolerated. So in the SHIFT trial, uh, they actually looked at over 6,500 patients with HEFREF, NYJ class 2 to 4 symptoms, and randomized them to receive either Evabradine or placebo. Of note, all of these patients had heart rates that were over 70 beats per minute, and they were all in sinus rhythm. So Evabradine was shown to significantly reduce their primary endpoint of CV mortality and heart failure hospitalization by 18%. And these benefits were shown very early at the three-month mark when the curves start to diverge and persisted, uh, became statistically significant at six months and persisted out to the end of the trial. So back to our first patient. He actually celebrated his 33rd birthday this March. We opted to start him on Secubitril Valsartan initially, but then at the subsequent clinic visit, we added in Evabradine and then further up titrated that to maximal doses of 7.5 milligrams twice daily. At his last clinic visit with us, he was actually biking and jogging for 20 minutes on the treadmill, um, managed to go to Cuba for a friend's wedding, still leading out and ordering in about eight times a month, which is probably not what Jeremy would have told him to do, but he is staying euvolemic with the assistance of a diuretic sliding scale and his mother, who manages to keep a very close watchful eye on him. All right, so let's switch gears and talk about HEFPEF now. Our second case is about an 88-year-old woman whose past medical history includes atrial fibrillation and uterine cancer, which was treated with surgical resection more than five years ago, complicated by lower limb lymphedema. And in terms of cardiac risk factors, she only has hypertension. She was given a new diagnosis of heart failure after being seen in the ER with gradual onset of dyspnea exertion, orthopnea, PND, abdominal pain, and they diuresed and discharged her home on Lasix 80 milligrams POBID, first time ever taking Lasix. In terms of her heart failure investigations, we did manage to get an NT pro BMP, and that was elevated. And her echocardiogram demonstrated normal left ventricular size and function, but they did note her LV mass index was increased, and she also had moderate to severe mitral regurgitation. So when she sees you in clinic, she's got NYH class 2 symptoms. I'm currently taking metoprolol 12.5, BID, amlodipine 5 once daily, apixaban in addition to her Lasix 80 milligrams twice daily. On examination, you find that she's a bit hypertensive. Pulse is irregular at 67 beats per minute, but she's fairly euvolemic. You know, she's got some chronic pitting edema, but she tells you that's back to her usual baseline. Blood work is normal, and her ECG shows only atrial fibrillation at 70 beats per minute. So, how would you manage this patient? Any thoughts on uh, starting her on spironolactone? Votes for that? Okay, a couple hands up. What about starting her on candesartan? More hands up for there. How about increasing her amlodipine? Okay, no hands up there. And the last, all of the above. Some people holding out for that? No. Okay, so most popular kind of A and B equal split. 
Well, the 2017 CCS guidelines state that there are three principles underpinning the pharmacological management of HEPPEF, and that includes, number one, identifying the root cause, number two, as well as comorbid conditions that might exacerbate your heart failure syndrome, and three, you got to control the symptoms. So we all know that hypertension is one of the root causes for HEPPEF in both men and women, and this uh, is the SPRINT trial that was recently published in the New England Journal of Medicine, which enrolled more than 9,300 patients who had a systolic blood pressure of at least 130 millimeters of mercury and increased cardiovascular risk, but without diabetes. And they were randomized to either the intensive treatment group with a target systolic blood pressure of less than 120, or the standard treatment group with a target systolic blood pressure of less than 140. The primary composite outcome was myocardial infarction, other ACS, stroke, heart failure, or death from cardiovascular causes. And actually, this trial was stopped early after three years because they found that there was a significantly lower rate of the primary outcome in the intensive treatment group. And additionally, all-cause mortality was also significantly lower in the intensive treatment group. So that is why the 2018 Hypertension Canada guidelines state that for anyone who is at high risk of cardiovascular events, um, and with the four criteria listed on the slide here, they should have a target systolic blood pressure of less than 120 millimeters of mercury. So now we know what the target is. Well, what medications do we use to actually achieve that? Do we have any evidence-based medications out there for half pef And uh, the answer is, well, not really that much. But if you dig deep, you might be able to find two trials regarding a couple of medications that have been shown to have moderate impact on HEFPEF outcomes. And that includes the Charm Preserve trial, which randomized more than 3,000 HEFPEF patients to receive either candesartan or placebo. And although their primary outcome was negative, they did see that the patients on candesartan had significantly lower rates of heart failure hospitalizations. This, we also have the TopCat trial, which randomized over 3,400 patients with an LVF of at least 45% to receive either spironolactone or placebo. Their primary outcome was a composite of death from CV causes, aborted cardiac arrest, or heart failure hospitalizations. And although their primary outcome was negative, when you looked at the actual components of the primary outcome separately, you saw that spironolactone significantly reduced heart failure hospitalizations. But interestingly, in a post hoc analysis, they realized there was about a fourfold difference in the primary composite event rate uh, when they factored in geography. And specifically, when they excluded the folks that were enrolled from Russia and Georgia, Eastern Europe, uh, which were completely different from the patients enrolled in other places in the world for this trial, and they just focused on the Americas, they actually saw that spironolactone led to a significant reduction in their primary endpoint. So the 2017 Canadian Cardiovascular Society Heart Failure Guidelines suggest that candesartan and spironolactone be considered for use in HEFPEP patients. They recommend that hypertension be controlled according to CHEP guidelines and also that loop diuretics be used to control symptoms of congestion and peripheral edema. So for our patient, basically if you'd chosen any of the above, you would have been correct. So to summarize, this figure illustrates the fundamental differences between HEFPEF and HEFREF. We know that there's a lot more robust evidence behind the medical management for patients with HEFREF. Specifically, we should be using beta blockers, ACE inhibitors, MRAs, and if they continue to have NYHA class 2 to 4 symptoms on optimal medical therapy, this is when we can consider switching the ACE inhibitor to an ARNI or adding an Avabradine if their heart rates are at least 70 beats per minute. And then with respect to HEFPEF, we have a couple of trials that show moderate impact of ARBs and MRAs. However, there may be more exciting news coming down the pipeline because there's some late-breaking trials that we're expecting to be released shortly about our knees in the use of HEFPEF. And finally, I'd like to draw your attention to this excellent figure from the 2017 Canadian Cardiovascular Heart Failure Guidelines, which provides a fantastic summary for all of the therapeutic options available for patients with HEFREF. Thank you very much.